Well, maybe you're like me and in your life you've not dealt with a lot of blood. I really have been very blessed to not deal with a lot of blood in my life. I do not like needles. I do not like being around those things, so I just avoid it at all costs. But there is one time in my life when I remember having to deal with blood. Now see, many of you will know because you've been around for a while that I've told some stories about the fact that I am a seventh degree black belt in the martial art form of kujitsu. And the thing I loved about being able to train in that form is that I was able to work my way through different degrees of black belt and in doing that and taking the time and the effort to work on that, I thought, well, this shouldn't go to waste. Maybe we should teach other people how to do it. So Phil and I opened up a karate school years ago, right when we were first married, and we had a great time teaching students and youth and kids the martial arts form of kujitsu. But the other thing that you often do is that when people find out that you are skilled in that form is they ask you to come and do demonstrations. So I was asked to come and do a demonstration in Atlanta, Georgia for a youth group of a large church there. And my dad, who was also trained in this same form, was there doing this with me. And we'd done this enough, like we knew what we were doing, but for some reason during this particular part of the demonstration, we did not plan things out very well. My dad wanted to show the group how you get out of a bear hug. And so if you don't know what a bear hug is, it's when somebody comes and grabs you from behind and they pin your arms to your side so you can't get out. Well, for some reason, my dad, who was 6'2", he was the center for his high school basketball team, like he's a big dude. He wanted to be the victim and I was supposed to be the attacker. Yeah, it looked as ridiculous as you can imagine. So I was coming behind my dad and I was grabbing him around the arms and I grabbed him as tight as I could. And then as I'm sitting there staring at the back of his back, I remember thinking to myself, he never told me what he's gonna do. Like, I don't know what he's, how he's gonna get out of this. And before I had time to really think of that, he broke out of the hold and smacked me in the face with his elbow. And I remember my head going back and I saw some Tweety Birds for just a little while, and then I kind of came to, and I was like, okay, let's keep going. And so we kept going with the demonstration until he sort of looked at me and like this, and I thought, what are you looking at? Do I have a, something in my nose? And then I started to feel it was wet, dripping all the way down my neck and onto my uniform, and I looked down, and there was all this blood. So we stopped the demonstration, and we went in, and. I took off the gi, top part of my gi, and we started scrubbing it in the kitchen of that church, and I was trying to scrub the blood out, and I will never forget sitting there thinking to myself, blood is hard to get out. Like, it is a stain that sticks. Isn't it interesting that God chose blood to be the one thing that would make us whiter than snow? Would you pray with me? God, we are so grateful that you are in this place and that your spirit is here. We love the sound of your voice. So I pray that you would speak to us and open our hearts and our ears that we would hear you today and be changed. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said, amen. So we are in the midst of the season of Lent. And Lent is a time when we take a good hard look at ourselves and we come face to face with our sin. But you cannot come face to face with your sin and survive unless you also come face to face with Jesus. And so that's what we are doing in this time as we take this good hard look at ourselves. And if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we are in a series called Clean Hearts. And it's a phrase that comes from David, who wrote the Psalm, Psalm 51, as a plea for forgiveness from God after he had committed some terrible sins. Now, I think it's funny that we, that we put an adjective before sin, like terrible sin, like there are sins that aren't terrible. But we do that as humans, don't we? We rank sins, even though there is no ranking of sins. But David had committed adultery with a lady named Bathsheba, but he didn't stop there. No, he decided that he was also gonna murder her husband because he wanted him out of the way. Because when he found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, he knew he was in a pickle. So we're looking at this Psalm, and the first week we looked at it, Pastor D.A. talked about the faithfulness and the compassion of God, that David pleads with God and says, because of your unfailing love for me, because of your faithfulness, because of your compassion, I know I can come to you. And then last week, we talked about how David was pleading with God that he would wash him clean that he would make him clean. And we talked about different rituals that the Jews knew that were purification and cleansing rituals to make somebody clean from the sins that they had committed. But this week, we're gonna talk about verse seven. And you might think it sounds like all the other verses because it kind of does. 
But it also has something in it that I think is a different take on what David is trying to say with God and what God wants to say to us. So would you read this passage of scripture with me? Let's read it together. Purify me with the hyssop branch and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've got David here who knows Jewish tradition. And I would imagine that when you pray, you probably don't always say, purify me with the hyssop branch. Because it doesn't make sense in our context, in our time, in our place. But in David's context and time and place, it made perfect sense because David knew the Jewish history. David knew what the hyssop branch was used for. And you see, the interesting thing about a hyssop branch is that it grew all year long. You can see it right there. It's this picture of this beautiful purple flowering plant. But it, there was never a time during the year that the hyssop branch was not available. That's interesting. But David would have also known that in the law of Moses, in Leviticus, God had given instructions and had said, this is what you are supposed to do when you are unclean. This is what you need to do in order to be purified. And the interesting thing is that when we see the hyssop branch mentioned, it always has something to do with protecting people from death. You see, one of the purification rituals that is that if you have touched a dead body, then the priest was supposed to take a hyssop branch, mix it in the water and this other stuff that they mixed it with, purification things, and you mix that hyssop branch in there and then you sprinkle the person that had touched the dead body. And then they were able to re-enter the camp. They were purified, they were cleansed. But the other time that it is mentioned is when someone has been cured of leprosy. Now leprosy is not something we talk about a lot in our day and age because we don't see it. But let me tell you about leprosy. And let me tell you what leprosy has to do with death. Leprosy is a skin condition when you get sores on your skin that will not go away and it eats away at the skin. But the interesting thing about leprosy is that it does something deeper on a deeper surface than just your skin. It actually kills the nerve endings in your skin so that then you can't feel. But when you had been healed and cleansed of leprosy in order to re-enter the camp, where the Israelites were, the priest would take the hyssop branch and they would mix it in with the water and the other things that were mixed in to the water to make them pure and they would sprinkle it on the person that had leprosy. And then they were able to re-enter the camp. So when we see the hyssop branch mentioned, it always has to do with protecting us from death. And so we're going to take it just a step further back. We're going to go back even further in history to one of the first times we ever see the hyssop branch mentioned. It's in a time that changed the history of the world for everyone. Just that little plant. It was the time when the Israelites were called to come out of bondage. If you know the story well of the Exodus, you know that Moses was called by God to go to the Pharaoh, the king of the Egyptians, who had held the Israelites in captivity and bondage for 400 years and made them slaves. And Moses was to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But every time Moses went, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would say, no, I will not let them go. So God decided to send a plague on the Egyptians as punishment for what their leader was doing. Because that's interesting, isn't it? That the way we lead has an effect on all the people that we touch. And that was true for the Egyptians. So God would send plagues. He sent things like flies and locusts and hail. It's basically like living in Oklahoma. (laughs) And every time he would go to the Pharaoh and he would say, let my people go. And the Pharaoh would say, no, I will not. And God would send another plague. Until the very last plague, the plague of all plagues. God had said to Moses, you go to Pharaoh one last time and you say, let my people go. And he's not going to do it. And God said, I'm going to send the destroyer through Egypt. And I will kill every firstborn child of the Egyptians and of the animals that they own. But you see, God gave very specific instructions because this is a big deal. Anytime we deal with death, it is a big deal. So God gave very specific instructions about what they were to do, what the Israelites were to do, and the fact 
that became very clear was that Pharaoh was going to finally let them go, but they needed to get out of there in a hurry. So God gives instructions to Moses, and he says, I want the Israelites to eat, but do not put any yeast in the bread. Now, don't you love it that when God gives instructions about like the biggest moment in your life, he talks about food? I love that. It's either food or shoes. I mean, it's great, either way. But he talks about food. He doesn't say to them, I want you to clean your house and I want you to do it this way. I want you to get everything in order and I want you to do it this way. I want you to pack your clothes this way and fold your laundry this way. No, he doesn't say any of that because that's not important. It's important for them to eat because they need sustenance for the journey that is ahead of them. But he said, don't put any yeast in anything. Why? Because yeast takes time. I don't cook, but I know that. I know that when you put yeast in dough, it takes a lot of time to rise. And they didn't have time for that. So we're going to pause this story right here because I think there is a big piece of truth that God has for us in just this part of the story. Because God had said to them, I want you to eat, and I want you to eat this way. But he also said, when you put on your cloak, you're going to tuck it up into your belt so that when you run, you don't trip. And you're going to eat with the sandals on your feet, and you're going to eat with your staff in place. All of this means we're about to be in a hurry. you got to be ready to eat and run. It's like McDonald's. And so as they do that, they know that this is a big deal. And then God says to them, for generations to come, you are going to celebrate this as a festival of the Lord. It's going to be the Passover festival, and any time you celebrate this for seven days, you get all the yeast out of your house. Not just, we're not going to put yeast in our bread. No, you get the yeast out of your house. And then he says, if anybody has yeast in their house, you are kicked out of the camp. Why was the lack of yeast so important to God in this? Well, I think I know why. You see, yeast took time, time they didn't have, and God does not waste time on things that are not worth, worth wasting time on. You see, God has given each of us 24 hours in a day. Now, we all don't get the same number of days on earth, but we do get the same amount of time. Have you ever thought about that? Because each one of us gets eternity. You just get some of it here and some of it somewhere else. We all have the same amount of time. And time is a precious gift that God has given to you. Now, you may think, oh, that's a sweet phrase, and we've heard that, blah, blah, blah. But we need to recognize that today. Time is a precious gift. And sometimes we would make the mistake of thinking that some time is more precious than other time. For instance, the time we spend with our kids or the time we spend with our parents or our siblings or our best friends, that time is more precious than the time we spend at work or folding the laundry or doing things that seem insignificant. But the truth of the matter is, all time is precious. And God has done a great thing for us. He has given us the power to choose how we use our time. So whether we are children, whether we are youth, whether we are young adults, whether we are middle-aged, whether we are older, it doesn't matter. God has given us the ability to choose how we use our time. So I want you to picture yourself, picture yourself for just a moment waking up in your bed in the morning and thinking the first thought of, I have a certain amount of hours today. And then what would happen if we all asked ourselves, how much time am I planning to spend sinning today? How much time do I plan to spend not doing what God wants me to do? That's not how we do it, is it? Because too often we make the mistake of thinking that sin is something we just fall into. Like, oh, it just happened by accident. I didn't really mean to do that. It just sort of happened. Or I didn't mean to say that. It just happened. But that's a lie. Sin is an intentional use of our time in a way that God doesn't want us to use it. If the Israelites would have gone against God's decree and put yeast in their bread and just said, well, it's not really a big deal. We'll just wait till it rises because it'll taste better. He would have missed, they all would have missed God's freedom. Because time is important and sin is not something that just happens. Sin is an intentional use of our time in a way that God doesn't want us to use it. 
So if we each have 24 hours in a day, instead of waking up each day and thinking, I have all this time, I wonder how much time I'm gonna spend sinning, maybe it'll be three hours today, maybe two hours tomorrow. No, instead of thinking that, why don't we wake up and be grateful for the fact that we all have eternity. Everybody gets the exact same amount of time. And we all have the ability to look at God and say, how do you want me to use my time today? If no moment is more precious than another, how do you want me to use my time today? Think about how different David's life would have been had he chosen to use the time that he was sinning with Bathsheba in a different way. Had he chosen to use the time that he told the commanding officer to pull all the troops back and put Uriah at the front so Uriah gets killed, how different would his life have been if instead of intentionally using his time in a way that God didn't want him to, he would have intentionally used his time to glorify God. Some of you know the story of my nephew, Jacob, who died in a car accident when he was 15 years old. Jacob was a really special kid. I know, I know we often say that about people who have passed away, but he was special. When he was young, he had this amazing sense of humor. He could tell a joke and the timing was always perfect. He was one of those caring people that felt a lot. Like when you were in a room, he could kind of feel your emotions. And he would always go out of his way to ask how you were doing or kind of see what you needed. But when he was in junior high, he struggled. He struggled with depression, he struggled with anxiety, he struggled with relationships of his friends and his family. And because of those struggles, he started cutting himself. So he started inflicting self-harm. But because people loved him and because we wrapped around him, we got him the help that he needed through counseling, through prayer, through going to church, and he finally had this awakening. He had this awakening that the time that he used to spend cutting, the time where he would go in behind closed doors and hurt himself because he was already hurting so badly, then instead of using that time to harm, he figured out that he could use that time differently. And so he started making what we call in our family survivor bracelets. He would take paracord and he would braid it in a certain way and put the clasps on either end and he would give them away to people. And he, because of his hurt and his struggle, he could often identify other people that were struggling and he would seek them out and he would give them a bracelet and it started a conversation of, hey, this is how I survive. You can survive too. Because we all have the ability to determine how we use our time. And time is obviously important. If God said to the Israelites, don't ever put yeast back in your house during the seven days of Passover when you remember what I did for you, time must be really important to God. So when we wake up in the morning and we think about the span of eternity that we all get, the first question we ought to ask God when we get out of bed is how do you want me to use my time today? instead of intentionally using it in a way he doesn't want. So that was a set of instructions that God gave to the Israelites. Get ready to run and don't waste time on things we don't need to waste time on. But then he gave them another instruction, an instruction that has to do with that plant. One of the first times we see that plant used, he said, when the destroyer comes through Egypt, he will destroy every firstborn. But God wanted to protect the Israelites. So he said, take a hyssop branch and a lamb. Slaughter the lamb and dip the hyssop branch into the blood of the lamb. And then mark your doorframe, the top and the sides, with the blood of the lamb. Isn't it crazy that God put a stamp on time in that moment? He put a stamp on time that foreshadowed exactly what he was gonna do for all people. That the destroyer would see the blood and would pass over because he wouldn't be allowed in the house. But the other part of the instruction that God gives that I think is really important that we often glaze over is that he said, when you put the blood on the doorposts, don't go outside of the door. He told them, you've got to stay inside until the destroyer passes over. You can't leave. Don't leave 
the doorpost where the blood is covering. Because you see, the blood says something. It says something powerful. It says something to evil. It says something to that which would try to destroy us. And it says something without even having to use any words. Because God is the one who was willing to do what it took for us to be protected from death. And the carrier of that protection was that little plant. That little plant that was always available all year long. That didn't just grow in its season or grow in a particular time. No, it was always available to carry the blood that would protect us from death. And the blood speaks. One of the things I did love about my martial arts training is that I was able to see the progress through the belts that I got. So you start out with white and you end up with black in pretty much every form of martial arts that there is. But you know what's interesting about that is that when martial arts started, it didn't start out with different colored belts. It wasn't like a way for people to learn their colors. It started out in in ancient Eastern areas where they had to have a belt to hold up their pants and normally that belt was light colored. But the more they trained and the greater they became at their art, that belt got dirty and became dark. That's why now we progress from white to black because the black says, I have been tried, and I have been tested, and I've been found that I can defend myself. And today, when we have degrees of black, then little stripes are put on the belt that say our ranking. And when I am around other people who also are in martial arts, the belt speaks for itself. I don't have to walk up to them and say, hello, my name is Stephanie Greenwald, and I'm a seventh degree black belt, and blah, 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 blah. They just look at the belt and they know because the belt speaks for itself. The belt says, I earned my spot here. And I can defend myself. In the same way, in battle, in the battle between good and evil, the blood says the same thing. The blood that is on the doorpost of your life, the blood that covers your mind when evil tries to enter in with thoughts that are not of God. The blood speaks, and it says, my God has been tried, my God has been tested, and my God will defend me. The blood covers our bodies so that when we are tempted to sin in action, we have the choice. And the blood speaks. Did you know that the name Satan literally means accuser? Because that is his goal, to accuse us before God, to say, look at all these people and all their sin. Because when we sin, we can't be in the presence of God, and Satan knows that's how it works. But instead, the blood speaks, and it says, you don't have the right to accuse me anymore, not because of anything I have done, but because who my God is. That my God was willing to sacrifice where I should have been dead. My God was willing to step into my place, and the blood speaks for itself. But the thing you've got to remember and the thing I have to remember is when that blood covers the doorposts of our lives and is the sign of who we belong to, we need to not step out of that door. We need to not go do it on our own. We need to not think that we have the strength and the power to do what God did for us. We stay within that covering. We stay within that protection and we give God thanks that there is nothing more we have to do than to stay right where we are. Because the blood speaks for itself. So here we've got this time in history when God was ready to free the people from captivity, putting a stamp on the, on the mark of our history, your history, my history, for all of time. But then you fast forward hundreds and hundreds of years, and it is no coincidence that the time that changed everything is when we see Jesus around the Passover table. He was celebrating what God said to celebrate. Get the yeast out of your house 
and remember what I did for you. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I am the one who brought you out of captivity because that's what they were supposed to remember. So it's no coincidence that the moment that changed all of our lives was as Jesus was sitting around remembering that. But then he does something incredible as he takes the bread that doesn't have any yeast in it and he breaks it and he says, this is my body broken for all of you. And then he takes the cup of the blood, the Passover lamb, as they are sitting there remembering the hyssop branch and the lamb that was slaughtered and the blood that was put over the doors. And Jesus says, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says the most incredible thing of all, do this in remembrance of me. Now, you may not understand the significance of that because it took me a hot minute to figure that out. But if for hundreds of years, the point was to remember that God brought the Israelites out of captivity, now Jesus is drawing a line in the sand. And he's saying, God is now doing this for all people. I am the Passover lamb. I am the one whose blood speaks. I am the one who can save you not only from captivity of a human king, I'm the one who can save you from captivity of death and eternity because of his blood. And now he's saying, remember me. So if that's the case, if time is so important and God gives us this gift of time and he reiterates it hundreds and hundreds of years, he says time is important. Choose to do with your time what I want you to do with it and be ready. And if the blood speaks for itself, if the destroyer sees it and the accuser sees it and it changes everything, if all of that is true, then what does it mean when David says, purify me? Because in those two words, I think it could change everything for you and me today. Because you see, purification is when you remove contaminants. Because to be unpure is to have contaminants be a part of something. So instead of being 100% pure, or to have a 100% pure substance that is all itself. Being unpure is when something contaminates it, when there's other stuff mixed in. And so when David says, purify me with the hyssop branch, it is different than saying, forgive me. Because to be purified means that God removes the contaminants so that you and I can be 100% the people that God created us to be. Not 95%, not 75%, not 10%. We're not deluded. We are not supposed to be deluded with the contaminants of the world. But you might say, is that really possible? Like, I get the forgiveness thing. I get that God can forgive me of a sin. But is it possible for me to be 100% the person God created me to be? Yes. And let me tell you why. Because when God removes those contaminants, you want to know what he does that is miraculous and amazing and real is that he fills us with himself to complete everything that was incomplete. All the space left by the contaminants being removed isn't filled up with the rest of us. It's filled up with a God who loves you more than I could ever even express to you. And he fills you up to make you 100% the person you were created to be by him. But you still may have questions. You still may say, I don't know. I don't know about that. Because too often, even we preachers are guilty of preaching it, that we tell you that your life is just this vicious cycle of sinning and being forgiven and sinning and being forgiven. Like you just spiral sometimes up, sometimes down, and sometimes around, and so you don't even know where you are half the time. It's true that when you sin, God will always forgive you. That is true, but that's not all of the truth. When God purifies us, and he fills us with himself, and he makes us 100% the people that we were created to be, then we no longer have to live in the cycle of sinning. Because the problem with Christians today is that we believe in God. 
We just don't believe what he says. When God says, go and sin no more, we don't really believe it. When God says, I am the vine and you are the branches, and if you remain in me, fruit will abound, and you will be so closely intertwined with me that you can't tell where you begin and I end, we don't really believe it. And when Paul says, we are to be imitators of God, we are supposed to be like God, we don't always believe it because we don't think we are good enough. But the good news of Jesus Christ is you're not good enough. He is. And that's why when he purifies us and he removes those contaminants from our lives and he fills us with himself, then we are. We are. And then we live as the purified. Yes, the forgiven. Yes, the cleansed. But then we live as the purified, just like David said, purify me with the hyssop branch and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. David didn't have any doubt of God's ability to do what he said he was gonna do. But so many times we sit in our guilt and we sit in our filth. Even though we know God has forgiven us, we don't believe he actually did. And then we don't live as the purified. We live as the terrified. But God calls us to something greater. God calls us to live as 100% the people that he called us to be. Not on our own, but filled with himself. Time is really important. And sin is an intentional use of our time in a way that God doesn't want us to use it. So let's not do that anymore. Let's use our time the way God wants us to use it. And let's be ready. The blood speaks for itself, and it does cover the doorposts of your life. Stay within it and let it speak volumes to the people around you, to the ones who don't know Christ yet, and to the evil one. Because it does speak for itself. And don't believe the lie that you cannot be like God He's called you to it. That's what he wants. The world needs to see people who are like him. But the only way we can is to let him purify us, to make us 100% the people that he has created us to be. Purify me with the hyssop branch, and I will be clean. Let's pray.